The topic of my presentation is structural biology of transcription and transcriptional regulation. My laboratory has contributed structures to the protein data bank in four areas, namely transcription complexes, transcription regulation complexes, transcription translation complexes, and transcription initiation complexes. At this moment, there are 99 release structures and additional unreleased structures in the PDB. Uh, in my presentation today, I'm going to present a few representative examples from each of these four categories to provide an overview of what has been learned about transcription and transcriptional regulation from a structural perspective over the past two and a half decades. Start first with transcription complexes, and I'll turn to two structures that we reported in 2012. These were the first structures of functional, promoter-specific, factor-specific transcription initiation complexes, structures that revealed the key aspects of the transcription initiation process. There were two structures. Both were determined by X-ray crystallography, and these represent the first two structures that were determined entirely within my laboratory in terms of data collection, data analysis, and refinement. The first structure was a structure of an RNA polymerase promoter open complex, RPO, and it comprised a bacterial RNA polymerase shown in gray with its active center catalytic magnesium as a violet sphere, bound to the initiation factor, the transcription initiation factor sigma, shown in yellow, bound to a synthetic nucleic acid scaffold that represented the unwound portion of the promoter, the so-called transcription bubble, and the downstream DNA duplex. The second structure was the same, but also bound to a dinucleotide RNA primer, GPA, representing the complex engaged in primer-dependent transcription initiation. These two structures showed how RNA polymerase in gray and the transcription initiation factor sigma in yellow work together to recognize the sequence of promoter DNA. The structure showed that the sequence of the region upstream of the transcription start site is recognized as single-stranded DNA within the unwound transcription bubble of the promoter. Specifically, it's recognized as single-stranded non-template strand DNA. Thus, sigma in yellow interacts with the minus 10 element, six nucleotides shown in dark blue, and the discriminator element shown, uh, four nucleotides shown in light blue, making interactions, typically hydrogen bonded interactions with functional groups on bases in those elements and reading out sequence. The structure further showed that in a previously unanticipated feature, RNA polymerase core enzyme in gray also participates in reading out sequence information of the promoter as single-stranded DNA from the non-template strand, recognizing four nucleotides downstream of the elements recognized by sigma, sequences that include the transcription start site non-template strand, sequences that are now referred to as the core recognition element, CRE. For all of these nucleotides, there are hydrogen bonded interactions with functional groups on bases that allow readout of sequence. The structure also showed how RNA polymerase and sigma work together to unwind promoter DNA to form the transcription bubble. The structure showed that the first nucleotide of the minus 10 element, which is not visible here, it's behind sigma, and the last nucleotide of the minus 10 element, boxed in cyan, and the first nucleotide of the discriminator element, boxed in cyan, each is unstacked. For each of those, the nucleotide is unstacked from the stacked single-stranded nucleotides of the non-template strand. It's flipped, rotated 180 degrees, and inserted into a pocket formed by sigma, which contacts essentially every atom of the base and reads sequence. Likewise, the last nucleotide of the transcription bubble non-template strand is unstacked, flipped, rotated by 180 degrees, and inserted into a protein pocket formed by RNA polymerase core enzyme, specifically its beta subunit, 
where interactions are made with essentially all atoms of the base. These interactions with unstacked, rotated nucleotides inserted into pockets allow for very high fidelity sequence readout of those nucleotides. And more important, crucially, are interactions that only can occur with single-stranded DNA. Because these interactions only can occur with single-stranded DNA, these interactions enable RNA polymerase and the initiation factor sigma to use binding free energy to drive the unwinding of DNA from double-stranded DNA to single-stranded DNA to form the transcription bubble and enable this to occur without an, any additional input of chemical energy. No need for a helicase, no need for ATP hydrolysis. The structures also showed how RNA polymerase and sigma work together to pre-organize promoter DNA for subsequent reactions. The structure showed that a module of sigma, which we termed the sigma finger, enters the RNA polymerase active center cleft. It penetrates the cleft and proceeds directly to the active center region. There it makes direct hydrogen bonded interactions with Watson-Crick hydrogen bonding atoms of bases of the DNA template strand. Those interactions constrain the template strand to adopt an A-form helical structure, even though it is single-stranded, and constrain that template strand to engage the RNA polymerase active center, shown here with its catalytic magnesium ion in violet. By doing this, they pre-organize the template strand to be optimal for association with mononucleotides for de novo initiation or with short primers for efficient primer-dependent initiation. This explains the key difference between an RNA polymerase and a DNA polymerase, namely the fact that an RNA polymerase can do de novo initiation it is a function of these interactions. Because of these interactions, however, sigma finger is in the way for RNA extension. And as RNA extension occurs, the RNA physically comes into contact with the sigma finger and progressively pushes it out of the way, displacing the finger from the active center cleft. And this is part of the process that then triggers the escape from the promoter in promoter escape. The crystal form that yielded these two structures was able to accommodate a remarkably diverse set of nucleic acid scaffolds, primers, substrates, inhibitors, and effectors. And this has enabled us over a series of subsequent publications to determine a large set of high resolution structures that define reaction step by reaction step, the structural basis of transcription initiation and initial transcription. Uh, we've been able to obtain information on sequence specific recognition of the core recognition element, nucleotide binding in de novo initiation, primer binding in primer dependent initiation, DNA scrunching in start site selection and initial transcription, this process of RNA extension driving the sigma finger, displacing it from the active center, as well as inhibitor binding sites and mechanisms. As an example, if we start with the same crystals and soak into them two nucleotides, an initiating nucleotide and a non-hydrolyzable analog of an extending nucleotide, where we're able to, in that way, define the structure of the substrate complex that yields initiation, de novo initiation with mononucleotides, and we're able to see the construction, the formation of a bimetal active center that catalyzes phosphodiester bond information with one metal being always present on the enzyme and a second metal being brought in by the extending nucleotide. Similarly, by soaking into the crystal both an initiating nucleotide and an extending nucleotide, this time a bona fide extending nucleotide, not a non-hydrolyzable analog, we were able to obtain in crystallo synthesis of a dinucleotide product and then in crystallo translocation of the enzyme translocating DNA relative to its active center. And in this way to obtain structural information for the product complex in its interactions with the enzyme, and also for the process of scrunching by which the additional nucleotide single-stranded DNA translocated into the RNA polymerase active center cleft is accommodated. And we could see that the scrunching was accommodated by flipping a nucleotide out of the base stack so that one could still have on the non-template strand the same distance span by a larger number of nucleotides and still could maintain a continuous stacking. 
turning to transcription regulation complexes. In 1996, our first database entry, our first PDB entry was made. This was from a structure that was determined by a joint project between our laboratory and the laboratory of Helen Berman at Rutgers. Three years earlier, Tom Stites and his co-workers had reported a structure of an activator protein, TAP, bound to its DNA site. And this activator protein, TAP, is the classic textbook example of a transcription activator. It activates or increases transcription at the LAC promoter in E. coli. Unfortunately, in this stite structure, the resolution was not sufficient to define unambiguously the individual amino acid base contacts between CAP and its DNA site. Our laboratory engineered a DNA site sequence and DNA site structure that enabled formation of complexes with two orders of magnitude higher affinity, and Helen Berman's laboratory was able to use those complexes with much better order to determine a structure of the CAP DNA complex at a resolution that enabled unambiguous identification of amino acid based contacts. The structure showed that each CAP subunit contains a helix turn helix motif that recognizes DNA, shown here in gray, and that each of these two subunits of the dimeric CAP protein insert the helix turn helix motif into the DNA major groove, such that residues of the second helix of the motif make direct contacts with base edges that read sequence. And the results of the individual amino acid base contacts that were identified corroborated interactions that we had defined previously biochemically and genetically. Then in 2002, again in a collaboration between my laboratory and the laboratory of Helen Berman, also adding into the collaboration Kathy Lawson, we determined a structure of CAP bound to its functional target in a transcription initiation complex. Uh, in biochemical and genetic work, our lab had shown that CAP activates transcription at class one CAP dependent promoters, such as the LAC promoter, through protein-protein interaction with RNA polymerase alpha subunit C terminal domain, alpha CTD. And specifically, we had shown that alpha CTD region called the 287 determinant interacts with a surface of CAP called AR1. A second determinant, the 265 determinant of alpha CTD, interacts with the DNA minor groove adjacent to CAP. And a third determinant of alpha CTD, the 261 determinant, interacts with an adjacent transcription initiation factor sigma. Working with Helen Berman and Kathy Lawson, we determined crystal structure of CAP bound to its DNA site and simultaneously bound to alpha CTD, its functional target from within RNA polymerase. The structure confirmed that the activating region 1, AR1 of CAP, interacts with the 287 determinant of alpha CTD, confirmed that the 265 determinant of alpha CTD interacts with the adjacent DNA major group, sorry, minor group, and confirmed that the 261 determinant of alpha CTD would be available and presented in the direction such that it could interact with the rest of the transcription machinery. The structure revealed the details of the interaction between AR1 and the 287 determinant, confirmed residue by residue, the individual residues making those interactions that we had defined genetically and biochemically, and supported the view that the interaction provides a small favorable protein-protein interaction surface that provides a small, just 2 kcal per mole, or factor of 25 in terms of equilibrium constant, increase in ability of RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter when CAP is making this interaction. The structure also revealed the details of the interaction of alpha CTD with the minor groove, showing how it recognizes an AT rich minor groove through narrowing of the groove and through recognition of the spine of hydration in AT rich minor grooves. Then in 2009, the same team, namely my laboratory, uh, Helen Berman, Kathy Lawson, now expanded also with the laboratory of Eddie Arnold at Rutgers and working in the facilities of Bridget Carragher, then at Scripps, determined a three-dimensional structure of the intact activation complex. Uh, this was done by single particle EM, single particle reconstruction EM, using at this time before the resolution revolution, uh, negative stain rather than cryo EM. 
The map that was obtained, even using negative stain, was sufficiently detailed that we could unambiguously fit into it our previously determined, determined structure of CAP, alpha CTD, and DNA, as well as structural models and later structures of the transcription initiation complex and obtain a complete picture of the structure, which shows that when CAP interacts with alpha CTD and alpha CTD in turn interacts with DNA and sigma region one, a uh, sigma region four, a part of the sigma transcription initiation factor, that there are no changes in the structure of RNA polymerase relative in the absence, relative to in the absence of the activator, indicating that all the activator is doing is providing a recruiting interaction, a simple protein-protein interaction that increases the stability of binding of RNA polymerase holoenzyme at the promoter. The activator that I just described, the regulator that I described is a regulator of transcription initiation, but regulation also occurs at other steps in transcription initiation. And in recent work, we've used cryo-EM to study how those subsequent steps of transcription can be regulated. In the interest of time, I'm going to simply pass that and move on to the next category. This next category is uh, transcription translation complexes. The transcription process is tightly integrated with other cellular processes, and in bacteria and in archaea, is very tightly coupled in particular to translation. In 2020, we reported a series of cryo-EM structures, single particle reconstruction cryo-EM structures that reveal the structural basis of this transcription translation coupling. So for background, bacterial transcription and translation occur in the same cellular compartment. They occur at the same time. And in most bacteria, including the standard molecular model organism E. coli, transcription and translation are coupled processes in which RNA polymerase synthesizing a messenger RNA is kinetically and physically and functionally coupled with the first ribosome, the lead ribosome, translating the messenger RNA. As a result of this coupling, an RNA polymerase molecule can rescue a paused ribosome, pulling it forward, and a ribosome can rescue a paused RNA polymerase molecule, pushing it forward. This transcription translation coupling in E. coli is thought to be mediated by the transcription elongation factor NUSG, which comprises two domains and a linker. The N-terminal domain is thought to interact with RNA polymerase. The C-terminal domain is thought to interact with ribosomal protein S10 in the ribosome. And the intact factor is thought to bridge RNA polymerase and ribosome. In addition, transcription translation and coupling, coupling in E. coli also is thought to be mediated by a second transcription elongation factor, dust A. We took advantage of the power of cryo-M, in particular the power of cryo-M to address large complexes, such as a complex comprising both RNA polymerase and a ribosome, and also the power of, of cryo-M to address many complexes quickly without the need for crystallization. We took advantage of those factors to determine structures of transcription translation couplings with seven different nucleic acid scaffolds shown at the bottom. All of these nucleic acid scaffolds contained DNA and each contained one of the seven RNA molecules shown in red. This gave us seven scaffolds. Each of them contained, as shown by the dashed line, the determinants that direct formation of a transcription elongation complex upon addition of RNA polymerase over here, and the messenger RNA determinants, namely a translation start code on AUG, that directs formation of a translation complex upon addition of a ribosome and initiating tRNA over here. And then each of the seven scaffolds had a spacer between the determinants that form the transcription elongation complex and the translation initiation complex. And that spacer minutes, differed Richard. in length by four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10 codons. For each of those, we then added RNA polymerase, a ribosome, initiating tRNA, and optionally the coupling factors, and determined structures by single particle reconstruction cryo -EM. And with short, with nucleic acid scaffolds that had short spacers, we obtained one structural state. With nucleic acid scaffolds having longer messenger RNA spacers, we obtained structures of a new molecular assembly 
this assembly with features that indicated it's the assembly that functionally mediates transcription, translation, coupling, and E. coli. And that's shown here. And we could see in these structures how the transcription initiation elongation factor, NUSG, bridges an RNA polymerase molecule and a ribosome serving as a tow rope, in essence, that enables the RNA polymerase to pull the ribosome out of pause states, and how the second transcription elongation factor, NUSA, forms a second bridge that serves essentially as a push bar that allows a ribosome to push forward an RNA polymerase. Moving on to the last area, which are transcription inhibitor complexes, there are uh, therapeutic agents that function by inhibiting bacterial transcription. In particular, the first line treatment, a first line treatment for mycobacterium tuberculosis infection, namely TB, and for non tuberculous mycobacterial infections, is the rifamycin class of inhibitors. Uh, in 2017, we reported structures of the mycobacterium tuberculosis transcription initiation complex bound to those rifamycin based inhibitors. These structures defined how the inhibitors bind to RNA polymerase, show the details of the interaction, and have been used by our group and collaborating groups to design new rifamycin-based inhibitors that show ability to uh, inhibit resistant uh, mutations, resistant mutants of mycobacterium tuberculosis. Time to wrap up, Richard. Thank you. OK. Structures show how those inhibitors work. The structures show that we can then identify other inhibitors that function through different binding sites. We can define the interactions by those inhibitors, have used this information to synthesize more than 500 derivatives of that class of inhibitor to show that those inhibitors uh, are effective against strains of mycobacterium tuberculosis resistant to the rifamycins, and to demonstrate activity in animal models of tuberculosis infection. And we have shown that these inhibitors can be combined. One can combine a rifamycin and an inhibitor of the second class to obtain additive antibacterial activity and to suppress the emergence of resistance from levels of 10 to the minus ninth per generation for individual inhibitors to below the limit of detection for the combination of inhibitors. And this process can be extended by analyzing other inhibitors and their binding sites and their functions. So overall, it has been possible to understand how transcription works, how it is regulated, how it interfaces with other processes, and how we can use this information uh, to advance our understanding of existing therapeutic agents and design others. So thank you for your attention.